The aim of this project was to create a simulation of evolution. First I constructed an environment which I think of as the primordial soup. The environment is then populated by food, that is depicted by yellow circles, and organisms which I think of as fishes, that can move inside this environment. The organisms become hungry over time, and need to feed themselves by moving on top of these food resources. If an organism does not collect enough food, it dies of starvation. But if an organism collects too much food, it dies of overfeeding. The health of an organism is depicted by its color. Red means that the organism is healthy. The organism turns white, either if it is too hungry or if it is too full. Notice that every organism has two antennas extending from its body that it can use to detect food. I can now overlay every organism's brain on top of its skeleton. You are looking at 10 organisms with randomly generated brains. The brain is represented as a directed graph, where every node is a neuron and every edge is a connection, an axon or dendrite, that can carry nerve signals between the neurons. The network is then programmed to function as a crude approximation to the biological processes that we see in our brains. That is, when a neuron is hit by an activation potential along some edge, the neuron becomes more excited. This excitation decays over time, but if a neuron's excitation ever reaches a threshold, it fires a signal along every outgoing edge. After a neuron fires, the excitation is reset, together with some penalty, to simulate the hyperpolarization of the membrane and the subsequent refractory period. Every neuron has two parameters, the threshold at which it fires and the decay rate of its excitation. Similarly, every edge has two parameters, the speed at which the edge transmits the signal, which models the myelin coating of the axons, and the strength of the connection. The strength is a real number between negative 1 and 1. If the strength is below 0, the edge is inhibitory, and impulses traveling down this edge actually decrease the excitation of the target neuron. The input-output conventions for each organism are as follows. Every food resource generates an exponentially decaying smell. The firing frequency of the two input neurons at the antennas is directly proportional to the summation of all smells. In other words, the neurons in the antennas fire more frequently when they are close to a food resource. Every organism has three output neurons that change its position and orientation in the environment. There are two output neurons on the sides of every organism. When these two neurons fire, they turn the organism either left or right. And if the neuron at the tail fires, it propels the organism forward. There is one more sensory neuron that I call the fullness neuron. Its firing frequency is proportional to the fullness of the organism. So as the organism gets full, the neuron will start to fire more rapidly and convey this information to the brain. The last special kind of neuron is what I call a clock neuron, which fires at a regular frequency and introduces background activity into the brain. And finally, a genetic algorithm is implemented to seek an organism that can survive well in this kind of environment. The fitness is measured in a number of simulation ticks that the organism survived. First, a big initial population made up of random organisms is placed into the environment and evaluated. Then, standard sexual reproduction consisting of both crossover and mutation is used to generate new offspring from the successful organisms. I will now show you a couple of organisms that evolved a good brain structure via this approach. The organisms you see now are a result of about a day of computation. The organisms seem to have evolved a good food-seeking system and can easily locate food resources. In addition, notice that when an organism gets too full and becomes slightly white, the fullness neuron somehow inhibits the, this food-seeking activity and stops the organism from consuming food that would otherwise lead it to overfeed and die. So for example, this organism here is too full, the fullness is at 130, 100 being the best, and waits until it consumes the food. So this organism is actually pretty full, but it keeps on going until it finds food in front of it, and that's when it stops. So there's some kind of an AND gate that developed that stops it only if it's full and there is food in front of it. So it stopped now, and it's probably going to wake up soon to consume the food. Clever. So this one keeps going, and now it stops, and now it takes the food. 